Good morning. Can you hear me? Well, first I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. I'm always happy to be back in Lviv. And thank you all for coming. This might be the closest I ever get to a soccer stadium in, in my life. Um, so let me first say that um, Olya asked me to open this forum with an inspirational speech. Um, and I was a bit concerned about this because historians don't generally excel at, at inspiration. It's, it's a bit of a professional deformation, as they call it in French, that we're much better at understanding past catastrophes than we are at saving the world. Although some of us try to save the world, but it, it hasn't yet happened. Um, this has also been a very hard year for me um, as an American as far as saving the world is concerned. I had a lot of Ukrainian friends and colleagues on the Maidan who wanted to move Ukraine closer to American-style liberal democracy. And somehow, in, instead, America has moved much closer to nepotistic oligarchy. Which, which naturally was not the preferable direction of influence. Um, and all, all year I keep hearing in my mind um, what Czesław Miłosz wrote in, in Zniewoloni Umis, in The Captive Mind, shortly after he defected from communist Poland in 1951, uh, where he said, what Americans don't understand is that the obichai um, civilizacji jest kruchy the habit of civilization is fragile. And it, it's very much been a year of experiencing the, the kruchos czegoszczyckiego, the, the fragility of it all. So, so Olya asked me what I wanted to title this inspirational speech, which I, I'm not sure is actually going to be inspirational, but I will do my best. And I, I told her, well, why don't we take the phrase Zhit v Pravdia, which is Czech, from Václav Havel's famous Samizdat essay, Moltz bez Moltznich, The Power of the Powerless. Um, and, and so somehow Olya decided that we should just use Moltz bez Moltznich, The Power of the Powerless, so as to sound more inspirational. So I, I worry a little bit, like expectations are, are too high. Václav Havel understood truth as a weapon against totalitarianism. And so before I, I talk about totalitarianism and, and Václav Havel, I want to talk a bit as a historian and as a historian of, of thought and of philosophy about the history of truth. Um, so one of the things that enlightenment brought us that modernity brought us was epistemology as first philosophy. So questions, by epistemology, I mean questions about knowledge, about the possibility of knowledge. And the, the central question that philosophers were worried about was, does the world exist? How do I know the world exists and it's not just a projection of my consciousness? How do I know that that coffee cup is really there and it's not just inside my head? How do we move from inside consciousness to outside, from, from mind to world, from consciousness to being, from subject to object? Um, this was a problem, Leszek Kowalkowski likes to describe this as the problem of the bridge from inner to outer. And in particular, enlightenment brought us this problem because of the way in which modernity has first sidelined and then killed off God. You know, so first in the 18th century, God gets relegated to a minor role and pushed off stage, and then by the, the, the late 19th century, God is killed off entirely. So without God to serve as that bridge, from subject to object, from mind to world, we need to find a bridge on our own. We need to use our reason. 
And this was essentially the history of, of Enlightenment epistemology. And, and since I'm here in Lviv and we're here in Lviv, I can't, I can't resist saying a few words about Roman Ingarden, um, the Polish philosopher from Lviv, who spent his entire life determined passionately to prove the existence of the world, to prove the empirical reality of the world. Um, and at a certain point when he's a young man, um, when, when Lviv is still Lemberg, he leaves Lviv um, and Kazimierz Tvardowski, with whom he's studying, and he goes to Gettingen to study with the philosopher Edmund Husserl. He is drawn by Husserl's slogan, zu den Sachen selbst, to the things themselves, and by Husserl's insistence on Klarheit und Deutlichkeit, on clarity, and distinctiveness. Husserl was the, was the Barack Obama figure of his day. He was the one who said, yes, we can. Yes, we can find that bridge. Yes, we can get from subject to object. Um, and that's what drew R Roman and Garden initially to Germany, and I'll, I'll come back to him a bit later. <sighs> Stalinist totalitarianism, above all, then comes in in the 20th century as a kind of Frankenstein of, of enlightenment, of modernity, of claims to have found absolute truth. And, and here I'm going to say claims to have found absolute truth, and truth in the sense of istina, perhaps more than in the sense of pravda, and I'll come back to that in, in a moment. Um, yet, of course, this, the claim to absolute truth by a kind of dialectical inversion if you will, in fact, led to rule by lies. Because once truth as such, transcendental truth, Istina, was discovered, then reality had to be made to conform. Um, and I'll, I'll, maybe cite, um, I'll maybe cite Nikolai Berdyaev on, on this topic, and you'll, you'll forgive my bad Russian here, where he writes in 1939, in the wake of, of the Stalinist terror in the Moscow show trials, in an essay called Paradox Logi, he says, Logias glavnaya asnova tak nazivayemnik totalitarnik gosudarst. Bez organizovani Logi ani nikagda niemagli bi bit sozdani. Loj. So vremeno volmira nies loj v subjektivnom smisla, v smisla grekat subjekta. Eta logiest virajenia glubokova perirajenia straktori silznania. Izmira vsia bole izčezajet ličnaja sovjest i vsia mienši slišica je ogolos. So he's talking here about the fact that, that a lie in the contemporary world is not a lie in the subjective sense, in the sense of a, a sin committed by the subject. But there's actually a lie in the sense of a, a deformation or a degeneration um, of, of the structure of consciousness. And that there's a relationship between consciousness and conscience because as the lie deforms the structure of consciousness, conscience, Sylviest, flees from the world. Now, Hannah Arendt, trying to understand the essence of totalitarianism, also turns to this problem of truth. And she begins by making a distinction, which is quite similar to the distinction you make in Ukrainian and Russian between istina and pravda. So that in English, we don't have that distinction. In German, she doesn't have it either. Um, but she begins by distinguishing what she calls philosophical truth, by which she means eternal, transcendental, rational, non-contingent, a priori truth, from empirical, factual truth, a posteriori truth. Um, so she begins by distinguishing the kinds of truths that could be the existence of God and the immortality of the soul but could also be the fact that two plus two equals four, or the Kantian categorical imperative that you should always treat people as an ends and not as a means. Those kinds of truths with our non-contingent, she distinguishes between the realm of empirical, factual truth, which are things that happened. 
Um, and she says that it's this realm of the empirical factual truth, pravda, that's particularly vulnerable to politics. And she says this is largely true because factual truth always bears the vulnerability of its original contingency, which is to say that 2 plus 2 necessarily must equal 4. But it's not necessarily true that Germany had to invade Belgian neutrality. It's not necessarily true you know, that the Anschluss needed to have happened. Those things did not have to have happened. They are true because they did happen. But they always bear the vulnerability of their original contingency because they could have happened otherwise. Um, Leszek Kołakowski, the, the great Polish philosopher, likes to say that it's precisely this contingency of the world, the fact that things happen in a way that is not predetermined, that has no necessary reason, that is existentially unbearable, the contingency of the world that's existentially unbearable that causes us to flee from it. Um, and Hannah Arendt focuses on this empirical, factual truth that always bears the vulnerability of its original contingency. And she says this kind of truth underwent a transformation in its vulnerability in the era of totalitarianism. She says that previously you had a kind of old-fashioned lie. This old-fashioned lie, she says, was like a tear in the fabric of reality. Something was torn. And the careful observer, you know, by, by focusing, by investigating, could discern the spot where reality was torn. In contrast, she says, the modern political lie, the lies of totalitarianism, were complete reconstructions of reality in such a way as to be seamless. There was no tear to perceive because the world was completely reconstructed. Um, so totalitarianism, with its claims of absolute transcendental truth, of kind of absolute istina, involved the seamless reconstruction of empirical truth, of pravda. So what came after that? Um, so as a historian, I would, I would date the break between this kind of modern era and the postmodern era, more or less to 1968. I think arguably the, the Warsaw Pact invasion of Prague led to the beginning of the end of grand narratives, the beginning of the end of Marxism. Um, Marxism was arguably the last of the grand narratives of modernity. And if modernity was an attempt to replace God, to find something to hold on to and give us certainty in the absence of God, then postmodernity begins when we give up on replacing God when we say that there's no God, there's no ersatz God, there's nothing to stand in for God. And this is truly when all that is solid melts into air. When Marx wrote all that is solid melts into air in the Communist Manifesto, he was being precociously premature. It doesn't yet happen. It doesn't happen until postmodernity. And postmodernity was an attempt then never again to fall prey to those grand narratives, to those all encompassing, seamless reconstructions of reality that totalitarianism involved. Postmodernity was precisely about skepticism towards these grand narratives. Um, the, the famous definition of the postmodern condition by Jean Francois Lyotard was postmodern as incredulity towards meta-narratives. Um, and when Jacques Derrida comes along with deconstruction, he says that there can be no holistic truth, no grand narrative, because words, the meanings of words, signifiers, text, they subvert themselves. They always contain within themselves the seeds of their own negation. <laughs> 
Meaning is never self-identical, but it's always fluid. It's in flux. It's both different from what it, what it is and deferred in the sense of still to come. It's incomplete. Meaning is always undermining itself. It's always more complex than we believe it to be. It's always more dynamic. It's impossible to grasp and hold because it's always in movement. Therefore, there is no determinant truth because words are always at play. And play is a favorite word of Derrida's. And so for Derrida, what, what deconstruction, in particular in postmodernism in general, should bring us is not a deficit of meaning, not a lack of meaning, but a surplus of meaning. The problem is not that there's not enough meaning, but that there's too much meaning. This fluidity, this excess of meaning, this constant motion is enormously creative. It's liberating, it's playful, and Derrida loves the word play. It's exhilarating, it's provocative. But it's also this infinite possibility and fluidity is, is unhinging. It's, it's what Hannah Arendt would call something that leads us to a state of bodenlosigkeit, this kind of groundlessness, um, there, when there's no stable ground to hold on to. Because if nothing is the same as it was a moment before, then you have no solid place to stand. If reality is only constructed by discourse, composed of signifiers that are always playfully and capriciously <coughs> at play with one another, then we have to ask ourselves if any reality at all exists that we should care about. If there is no determinant truth, then what can we do in the world? What possibilities for action do we have in the world? And Derrida defends himself, he defends deconstruction from charges of nihilism by saying that deconstruction represents the least necessary condition for identifying and combating the totalitarian risk. And he deeply believed, and I think he was very much sincere, that the refusal of all claims to absolute truth would protect us from totalitarian terror. Now, Derrida's was one response to totalitarianism. There was another response, another philosophical response to totalitarianism. In fact, another philosophical response that emerges precisely from the same tradition of Husserlian phenomenology. Um, and that response comes from communist Eastern Europe um, and is also a response to this enormous void that's left when Marxism falls. I'm not since Christianity had anything exerted the kind of seductive force over the minds of men that Marxism did. And in its fall, in its wake, it left a kind of fear of nihilism. And Havel's response to that um, had to do with truth and responsibility. Yeah, and many of you probably know this, this essay that was the inspiration for this talk, Motz Bezmotznik, The Power of the Powerless. Um, but for those of you who don't, let me briefly tell you what Havel says here. So this essay was written in 1978, kind of uh, on, on commission from Adam Miknik, whom, whom Václav Havel has just met at this point. And it introduces the character of the greengrocer, the ordinary shopkeeper who every morning goes into his shop and in the window, next to the carrots and the onions, he puts the sign in the window saying, workers of the world unite. And Havel says, why does he put the sign in the window? Is it his sincere, spontaneous desire to acquaint passers-by with his socialist consciousness? And Havel says, no, of course not. The greengrocer doesn't believe the sign. Moreover, the people who pass by and buy the vegetables don't believe the sign. Even the regime, the communist regime, the members of that regime themselves no longer believe the sign. Moreover, the regime knows that the people don't believe, and the people know that the regime knows that they know, and everybody knows that everybody knows. Nevertheless, they go on pretending. They live as if. And Havel says, from the greengrocer's point of view, what else can he do? He's powerless. If one day he decides not to hang the sign, perhaps to stash it at the bottom of rotten tomatoes, let's say, somebody could inform on him, 
He could be questioned. He could be denied the right to go on vacation. His children could be denied the right to education. He could be detained, interrogated, eventually in prison. He has no choice. And Hubble says, well, why, in fact, would all these bad consequences befall the greengrocer just for taking down the sign? Well, don't they, in fact, suggest that the hanging of that sign, in which nobody believes, is actually very important to the regime? In fact, if one day all the greengrocers were to take down their signs, that would be the beginning of a revolution. Therefore, the greengrocer is not so powerless after all. Because, Havel says, he is powerful, he is also responsible and therefore guilty, for it's the green grocer who allows the game to go on in the first place. The green grocer, Václav Havel says, is living a lie. He's living a lie in, in Jean-Paul Sartre's sense of mauvaise foi, of bad faith, which is self-deception. The green grocer is lying to himself. He's not lying to himself about his faith in communism. No, he knows that he doesn't believe in communism. He's lying to himself about his powerlessness. The premise of this essay for Havel is that there's a, a stable, real distinction what philosophers would call an ontological distinction, a distinction related to being between truth and lies. It's not a language game, and it's not something that's infinitely in flux. And for Havel, to some extent, the reality of truth is proven by contrast with the reality of lies. And this distinction between truth and lies remains, despite any epistemological confusion the ontological reality of the distinction remains. To live in truth is to seek and speak the truth, but to live a lie does not make the truth go away. It does not dissolve the truth. It only demoralizes the subject, in this case the green grocer, who lives an inauthentic life. Havel's response to the lies of totalitarianism is to insist that we all have a responsibility to live in truth, and that demands a faith that truth exists, that something like determinant truth exists. Um, and let, let me give you another example of this kind of distinction between the postmodern direction that this philosophical tradition takes in France and East European dissident philosophy, which is what I think is relevant here. Um, there's a very famous Polish film, which um, many of you may have seen, called Przesłuchania, The Interrogation, starring Krystyna Janda, made during the Solidarity era in 1980, 1981, um, and set entirely in Stalinist prison. Um, and it stars Krystyna Janda as Tonya, who is a young nightclub singer who is thrown in prison during the Stalinist era and accused of being the lover of a Western imperialist spy. She doesn't understand the accusations and she denies everything. The filmmaker keeps us in the prison cell with Tonya for two hours while she is tortured until gradually she admits to more and more of the story that the interrogators present to her, although never to the whole thing. At the end of the film, we never, we the viewer, we never find out what the true story was. We never find out which of the men the interrogator as asked her about were actually her lovers. If any, we never find out if any of them were spies. We never find out if one of her lovers was a spy, if she knew that he was a spy. So we end the film with this epistemological unclarity. But, and here is the important distinction, we are given to understand that there is a real version of events. We don't find out what it is, but we are made to understand that exist. It's not just like maybe this was true and maybe that was true and what difference does it make. We understand that there's epistemological uncertainty but not ontological uncertainty. A reality remains even if we don't access it. A stable reality remains even if we don't figure out what it is. <laughs>
the postmodern, and in particular the post-factual world, which is the subject here, I would argue begins when we move from epistemological unclarity to ontological unclarity. When we move from lack of certainty about knowledge to a lack of belief that there is such a thing as truth, that there is such a thing as reality. Um, Marcy, no. three minutes. Okay. So postmodernism, which, which kind of originates in the critical sensibility of the left. Postmodernism originates in some sense in Derrida's attempt to give us an antidote to totalitarianism. He believed in cosmopolitanism and hospitality and friendship and forgiveness. He was not a moral nihilist. Now, though, postmodernism has very much, of course, become a, a weapon of the right. And Peter Pomerantsev describes Putin's Russia as a place where nothing is true and everything is possible. And now we have an infinite number of seamless alternate realities in which you strip one away and there's simply another one, and you strip that away and there's simply another one. You give up on believing there is any reality underneath and you take it lightly. Um, so the Ukrainian writer Yurko Prohasko wrote in a, an article in, in Kritika after a, a discussion we had in Kiev about Peter Pomerantsev's book that Pravda, empirical truth, as opposed to Istina, is a kind of border or a boundary. And a failure to recognize empirical truth is a failure to recognize borders or boundaries. That's precisely what's happening. Um, it's precisely what's happening in, in America now. Uh, Trump's refusal to recognize truth is, is an attempt to save seal post volono. Everything is possible. Um, so in, in my last two minutes, I just want to say that there's an irony in moving post-factuality today from east to west, from Moscow to Washington. Um, but pharmacos, which was a favorite word of Derrida's, means both poison and antidote. And I'd like to argue that a return to Eastern Europe in terms of philosophy can serve potentially as an antidote to this crisis of responsibility in this post-factual world. You know, there was here a tradition of a, res of a philosophy of responsibility. Um, Václav Havel dedicates the power of the powerless to the memory of the Czech philosopher Jan Patochka, who liked to say that the thing about responsibility is that we carry it with us everywhere. Roman Ingarden insisted that we need the reality of the world as a precondition for responsibility. Karl Wojtyla, Pope John Paul II, gave the homily in 1970 upon Ingarden's death. And he praised Ingarden for what he called heroic thinking, heroichne mishlenya. And he says, Ingarden shed, shed drogo heroichno mishlenya, shed jebi doist. He went along the path of heroic thinking in order to get there. Because you have to think heroically in order to think reality to the end. And, and let me just end by one, one more thought um, by Leszek Kołakowski, who in reflecting on Ingarden and Husserl after his, his emigration from Poland in the 1970s, said that Perhaps we will never get there. Perhaps philosophers will never find that magic bridge to get from subject to object to get to absolute truth. Nevertheless, he said, you have to keep looking because epistemological questions are always already ethical questions and to give up on truth is to give up on ethics.